Morning, everybody. Started a little bit late just to give people a chance to uh, get on the webinar this morning. Uh, it was a little bit impromptu, but we thought it was appropriate given, number one, the market direction model changed, and number two, uh, Bernanke's, or Bertanke's, uh, however you want to call him, uh, his uh, comments today, which I didn't really find all that meaningful, but what that has to do with the market uh, today will We'll get to that. But anyways, Dr. K, I'll let you start things off since the market direction model just went to a uh, sell signal uh, not too long ago, half an hour ago, maybe a little more. Uh, can you comment on that? Sure. Um, well, we what we're what it's seeing is a weak bounce here. Um, it's the bounce is not supported by proper action on the, the part of leading stocks. The list of leading stocks continues to diminish. Um, and the downtrend is still intact, and so the model sees this as a potential to get to reinitiate its sell signal when the market is uh, is bouncing here. Um, in addition, uh, the and this is more much more on a fundamental level, and the model does not use fundamentals. It looks at price volume action on the basis of fundamental news. So the fundamental news is that the ECB and the U.S. Fed um, are pretty much foot dragging. You know, the ECB kept rates at one percent. There's, they're both basically saying if things get worse, then we're going to step in and accelerate quantitative easing. So with the downtrend intact, I think that that's, that bodes in favor of a continuation of the downtrend. And of course, as trend followers, um, one should stay with the trend. So therefore, until this downtrend proves otherwise, and given the fundamental backdrop, I think the odds are in favor of the continuation of the downtrend. Now that, all that is also, we, Gil and I were talking earlier today that it looks like we might also be in a slop zone in the meantime, which is also very possible. In other words, this market could go up another, you know, for another day or two. Um, and in a slop zone, reversion to the mean tends to play out in a more uh, prevalent manner. So in other words, if we go up another day or two, then reversion to the mean takes over, increasing the odds that the market will come back. In other words, it will come. It will drop back down and uh, revert to the mean. Um, and in, and uh, once the downtrend is intact again, and that might actually happen today. In other words, we could see a reversal day with bigger volume than the prior day. Then, and that bodes well in favor that the market should head lower in the days to weeks ahead. Yeah, so you, you are actually in a kind of a strange period or area right here because you undercut here and you went through the 200-day moving average and that is actually very obvious to the crowd and some of you may have noted over the weekend, this past weekend, that you had a lot of uh, market writers and commentators talking about uh, the, the sell signal that the market was issuing by breaking the 200-day moving average last Friday. I think there were some articles on Market Watch and I saw some stuff on uh, seeking alpha.com about that, but I think that was too obvious to the crowd. So it sets up what is an undercut of both the prior low in May and then the 200 day moving average. So that's a very logical bounce here. Whether this carries through or what it ends up turning into, we don't know, but I do think the logic of going to a sell signal on the market direction model, given that we did go neutral right here at the lows, uh, is that you're coming up to an area of potential overhead. What's your stop, your stop loss on this, Dr. K? What's the fail safe? Well, because reversion to the mean is <clears throat> is a factor here, um, the fail safe is going to be higher than it normally would be. In other words, the fail safe under many you know normal conditions would be say the high of today, but we're going to have to see uh, how that plays out. Okay, so still it's a fluid situation, so you kind of move with it. But you could kind of tell, at least from my perspective on the short side, that things got a bit played out. Uh, let's go to a. Uh, Well, we have the daily chart here, so we can just show. <coughs> you know, if you look at some of these stocks breaking down, you know, straight down, F5 breaking down. These are all the big clouds that we, I've been talking about for the last couple, three weeks. And VMware, you know, straight down to the 200-day moving average. And then finally, the one that was holding up the best did do what we thought it would do, which is uh, go to the 200-day moving average, undercut it, and then now you're bouncing. Now the question is, do these, some of these become short of us, they come up? And the answer to that is yes, but there is potential for them to continue to move higher and that all depends on what the market does from here. If the market continues to rally then my guess is you would see these continue to rally back towards the 50-day moving average. Normally when you see a failed pattern and basically what this is, as we've discussed previously, is a kind of a big punch bowl of death, a pot and a failure. So you bust the 50-day, here's a 10-week here, you rally up into it once and, and a lot of times these will take some time uh, 
to form out. So this thing could go sideways for a period of time. Uh, you know, you could have seen a leg down in the market uh, currently. So if we just go back to the Nasdaq, if you want to see this as one leg down, and now the market's going to chop sideways for a period of time before there's another leg down. If you want to take the bearish side, uh, that's one scenario. The bullish side is that you pretty much sold out here, and now you're going to turn around. You're going to get a follow through day in the next few days. And, uh, and go higher. If that's the case, then you certainly don't want to be trying to short stocks. You want to let the market rally continue and then try to come back if that is the case uh, uh, later on, if, if you see the, the signs that you're looking for, which would be a weakening market or market rolling over on heavy volume. But I could see this going all the way to the 50-day moving average. Uh, I could see it stopping here at this confluence of the uh, magenta 10-day and the green 20-day. So, and it's a very fluid situation. But I do think definitely you saw the uh, the cover signal on CRM to take profits. So the one that's a little less clear cut is LinkedIn. But you're basically coming down into this area of support, this base right here that I'm circling around right now, and uh, and you get some support in there. That gets you close to the uh, 200 day, but it is, and on the, the sometimes you know they won't get down to the 200 day, but they'll get down to the weekly moving average, which is equivalent in this case to the 40 week, but it didn't quite get there either. But you can definitely see how it's coming down on top of this whole pattern, so it makes sense it would bounce. And uh, and when you had this kind of action, that seemed like a cover point, I think that was on Monday, a little bit of a shakeout kind of got in here. I do think if we roll over again you will see this thing go through the 200 day moving average so the key here is if you're bearish on the stock or if the market doesn't follow through or give you any reasons to become bullish then you would be tracking these on the way up and looking to hit them once they got to a logical point of resistance on the upside which in this case could be any number of points you know it could be this area here because you have some overhead supply along this level uh, which I guess like 96 or so uh, so it could push up higher into there. Uh, if not, it could push higher into the 20-day here. You do have a little bit of, of congestion up that could push higher into the 100 area or the 103 area where the 50-day moving average is. And all of that is going to depend on what the market does. And so you kind of have to track it with the market, and that's just kind of what you're looking at here. I'll just go through some of the stocks I'm keeping track of on the short side and the ones that are rallying the most today. I've been watching Baidu. You can see this is kind of a big flow to rally. And you can scout if you're sitting short some of these names too long. So you, see, you actually see here this kind of undercuts this low here, coming down towards these lows in the market bottoms and it turns. And if you don't cover and, and take profits somewhere at a logical point on the way down, you can get these kind of snapback rallies, and they're not very fun to sit through if you run big positions the way I do. If you run smaller positions and you get in higher on the pattern, uh, say it's with, uh, well, let's go back to CRM. You know, for example, if you were shorting it in here and we were talking about it uh, all in this area here, and it breaks down, now it bounces. If you had a small position, you could probably be sitting with it and maybe using a higher stop and possibly using this bounce as an opportunity to add a little bit to your position. Uh, assuming it's it's going to work. The, the other uh, thing is to take a profit. I, I like to run heavy positions, pick a uh, reasonable profit target and just slam it to that target and then cover right there. May go a little bit lower, uh, but I, I like to play it that way because usually you get fast, sharp breaks on the short side when you get them. And you notice you have to be a little bit patient, kind of as I like to say, dancing with it or bobbing and weaving. I think dancing is a little Sounds more fun than bobbing and weaving. I don't like to think of it as boxing, although it can feel like that sometimes. But in any case, you are putting out here while it gets a little bit uh, you know, floppy uh, right around the 50-day moving average just underneath. But the break is very nice to play, and if you're in heavy, uh, you can do pretty well. Uh, so I think that's the way I like to do it. But I would say that if you have a small position, if you work small positions uh, on the short side and try to build them looking for a bigger move in a, in a longer-term bear market, assuming that's what we're in, uh, that can work also. So, but I think right now, on the, as far as the short side goes, I know we're on a sell signal with the market direction model, and we're kind of on the fence here because uh, you do have a reasonably quick fail safe on the upside. And so, just see how it goes. You can see the Dow now is going up 95 points. Uh, but I want to continue going through some of these. I'm not sure why. There we go. Never mind. 
uh, CCCMI, same thing. This one's come all the way down through the 200-day movie, and now it's back above. So it's now just got a turn tail. My, my guess is it's going to come in and diddle around first. If it's going to roll over eventually, or this may be the low. You know, you, you could be sold out on a lot of these names. So, like they say, bulls make money, bears make money, pigs get slaughtered. Don't be a pig, especially on the short side. Uh, you know, or just don't be slow. Here you have Cliffs Natural drilling, another one breaking out. I think this one's way too far down. Here's. Starwood Hotels, which is a late stage failed base, and it's railing up into this area. Is it shortable here? If, if the market rolls over, probably. Uh, I think AGU coming up. You know, this one's a kind of a big pod type failure. This is similar to CF, but you have this big ugly double bottom failing here. Now it's trying to rally back above the uh, 200 day moving average. Is there resistance here? Maybe, you know, but it could just continue going higher up towards the 50 day moving average. And you can see the market's picking up some momentum here. So, my thinking that you kind of want to lay low here uh, both ways as far as stocks, so that's what I'm doing. If you're following the market direction model, you could be uh, taking the, uh, the position in an inverse ETF. Uh, Dr. K, what's your favorite ETF, by the way, on the short side if the market does roll over since we are talking about the short side right now? EDZ continues to be EDZ. That tends to be the, uh, uh, the one that uh, falls the furthest uh, when uh, situations are weak since connect uh, these markets, whether we're talking U.S., Europe, Britain, <clears throat> uh, they're all connected quite well, and so it's the global emerging markets that get hit the most when the majors are also falling. Okay, I like that. Kind of a nice big pull. So you'd be buying this here today? So EDZ would be a buy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's go through some more of these. But just to show you where the positions are in a lot of these, see, just all the way down through the 200 day moving average on CAT. The fossil, of course, just a disastrous break. I don't know what this thing's doing now. Maybe it's going to make a bearish flag and go lower at some point, but that might take some time. Here's another one straight down on Freeport MacMoran. Decker's another one we've been following for a long time. Just just way, way down there now. Um, Apple, I can never decide whether it's a short or a long, but right now it's trying to hang in pretty tightly. And you'll notice in here you get a couple of tight closes. This is the weekly chart. Let's see if I make that a little bigger for you. But you can see getting some tight uh, action here along the lows. You have this little shakeout here, but notice that the market made a low uh, earlier this week and Apple's made a higher low, so it's actually looking a little more bullish in the fact that it is outperforming the market in a sort of contrarian way. So a very subtle clue to me, but I keep an eye on Apple here because I think if the market turns, Apple is going to come out of this base. And right now all this is is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine week base. Remember you start counting bases first red week down. And if, if you consider this a first stage breakout from here, which is this big ugly formation here that it came out of in, in January, then this would be a, a second stage base if you consider this a first stage base and sometimes the bigger moves occur off the second stage base so I, I'd be open to just keeping this you know on your plate and watch for some sort of potential pocket pivot uh, coming up through the 50 day moving average I think that's the best thing to be watching for on Apple by the same token my theory also could be that if the market does roll over here and break to new lows and it could be a third leg down in the market so you could see like a mini leg, one mini leg, two mini legs, and then this is going to be another mini leg to the downside. And if that happens, then you might see uh, Apple break down again. So like I said, it, to me it's in flux, but you're showing, showing some minor positive constructive things in the base right now that maybe it's viable. Uh, you know, it did hold the 555 level the other day on Monday, shook out below it, you picked up some volume. So... I think this is a key stock to keep an eye on here. Uh, MasterCard, some of you have talked about, notice this is rallying back into the 50-day moving average. If you consider this a late-stage failure, here's your rally up in here. If you shorted it, this is your stop at 426, 427, right around the 50-day moving average. We looked at Monsanto last week, and it was around the 50-day. Notice how it's going higher, so it's up here around resistance. Not sure I'd be shorting this one right now. Uh, Lyondale, just another example. Notice how a lot of these are stuff stocks, and you notice gold is getting hammered today, and, and so the stuff stocks tend to look weaker. I'm wondering if growth isn't really the place to be if the long side uh, becomes more viable. And on a relative basis, I think technology stocks are acting better than stuff stocks, which a lot of them have had these rallies like we've just been going through, anything from CAT, to FCX, uh, to uh, Lyondell, 
AGU, CF, all of those stocks have uh, been getting whacked. Here's CF. Google's another one. You see CF back above the 200 day moving average. Uh, Google also trying to rally back up into the 200 day moving average. But see, a lot of these things broken down pretty hard. So are they going to continue going down straight down? If we're in a very serious market, uh, bear market, yes. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's why, as Dr. K said earlier, we've been discussing this morning the potential just to be in a chop and slop zone. And so we'll get a sense of that over the, the coming days. Netflix, still $60. Uh, it's just about where it got to. That was my downside price target. So, you know, is that played out for now on the short side? Maybe it is. Uh, tractor supply, late stage base failure. So now it's trying to rally back up in here. I, I think this is probably going to test the 200 day moving average eventually. It doesn't meet the amount of shares, uh, average daily trading volume uh, that I like to see for a short sale setup. But it, you know, if you have a smaller account and uh, you're using, I'd say 90 level probably right now is an upside guide for a stop. It could rally all the way back up to the 50 day moving average or it could just set up again and go higher. But if you're going to short it, that's how you'd be handling it today, if you feel bearish today. So myself, I'm not putting any shorts out today. I'm just kind of hanging loose. I uh, have a couple small longs, and we'll just see where uh, where everything ends up going. And, and we'll get to some of the long side in a little bit here. Uh, you know, Racks is another one, below the 200-day moving average. All of these things. Weight Watchers looking pretty ugly. So uh, sodas up into the 200-day. Is it shortable here? Yeah, it could be. Uh, it's a little bit of a squirrely stock, and I, it, it, to me, I don't really like playing. It's it's much squirrelier than I would prefer. But in any case, you can see that there's a number of stocks rallying up into areas of resistance. Lulu busted wide open today, so probably heading for the 200-day. Watch the first bounce. But you notice this is a late stage failure. You had a rally up in here, and it starts to wobble, and boom, breaks to the downside. So. That's a lot of negative action you're seeing in uh, former leading stocks. I think the question is what is going to rise up to take their place. And you, you might, you, some of you guys were asking about this one last week, and we weren't all that thrilled by it. But you know, what do we know? Because the market decided uh, it knows more about this than we do, and the stock's going higher. So it looks very strong. That's a nice new leader. Uh, I don't know what that that one is doing there. Let's see. I like uh, this one. You know, has acted well, broken. Broken down uh, here, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Let me go through some that I actually think look. Well, let's look at some of the ones we talked about yesterday, real quick. Mellanox, you know, nice to actually break out. I would call this from this flag or, or base formation. Uh, it's also a pocket pivot. It's coming in a little bit, and that makes sense. It tends to be very volatile stock, but uh, has good numbers. And uh, if the market's going to go higher, this breakout should work. But if, it's, if the market's not going to go higher, it could just continue going sideways or break down if we get into a severe downside uh, leg from here. Another one looking at here is a breakout in uh, web.com. Pretty basic business. They just help companies, uh, businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, uh, maintain and uh, create and maintain a presence on the Internet, which is very important, I think, these days for business. So kind of a bread and butter type thing, it appears. But a breakout here. So, Dutch, you got any favorite stocks you're looking at, either long or short, right here? Not, not really. Not in this kind of uh, environment where um, you know we we've sent out some reports on uh, stocks like DG and uh, you know this one, MN, uh, MLNX. Um, you know those are those are the ones that if I had to play a stock on the long side, that's what I would I would be looked to to um, maybe sizing in slowly uh, in this kind of environment. You know, and uh, this uh, web.com stock is certainly, it's, it's a possibility because it's had, uh, you know, a prior gap up and now a breakout. And uh, the MLNX, I like that because it uh, had a very fierce uh, um, Bible gap. Well, I wouldn't call it a Bible gap up. That's pretty extended there, but right. uh, that bodes very well for the pattern. So I like this sideways action in the face of a downtrending market that we've seen in May. It's it's quite strong. Probably ML MLNX is my favorite one of the bunch. Uh, the well, web.com one is a little thin. It's yeah. uh, it's not a it's not an eight hundred million dollar company. And in this environment, you really want to be on board uh, stocks that are a little more liquid. Okay. Uh, so let's see what else. What else? You know, I thought I'd make some comments on Facebook. Um, you know, eBay is a one stock in ninety eight when they came public around. Uh, I forget, but it's a split adjusted two bucks. They were earning split adjusted one cent a share, which put them at 200 times earnings. 
back in October 98, they came public during a, a weak market and they broke down for 11 days before turning around. You're now down, well, I'm going to say 13 days. You're trying to stabilize in here on Facebook. And you got to wonder with everybody hating the stock that uh, if this thing isn't primed for a rally. So I'm keeping an eye on this one uh, for the possibility that if the market holds up here and begins to turn more sharply to the upside that this might turn around a la eBay in 1998. But it is interesting that now you can short it, you can borrow the stock and short it. And I almost think that's deliberately done to create a floor in the stock because you can suck in a uh, confluence of uh, short sellers and right now I think there's like 39.7 million shares of Facebook stock now sold short. And I'm going to guess over the last couple of days a lot of the selling has been uh, shorts coming in now that the stock is uh, available to borrow. So I'm wondering whether uh, all this ends up doing is creating a floor in the stock uh, with a bunch of people short the stock down here now that it's available for borrowing. But we'll see what happens. But something to keep an eye on if the market starts to turn uh, in the in the next few days or whether it breaks down, you just stay away from it. But can it go lower? Sure, it can go lower. But uh, just keep an eye on this here. So, uh, let's go to some questions. Is this juncture in the market reminiscent of 1998 where O'Neill's big stock principle took effect? Uh, 1998 isn't when O'Neill's big stock principle took effect. That's actually the, the period where I uh, sort of categorized it as such when he called me up one day to tell me, look at AOL, and AOL was moving sharply. He said, no, that's a big stock. And it just kind of struck me as uh, how he approaches the market, and that's like finding the big stocks. And we talk about that in our first book. You know, the stocks that are leading the charge, so to speak, the leading issues of their day, as Livermore would have said. But it's it's a concept. It's not something that took effect in '98. It's something that I recognized when he said that to me when AOL was moving in late 1998, and it rung a bell with me, struck a chord, whatever you want to say. I don't. Know, he used to like to ring my bell, but that's another story. Uh, but in any case, that's when I suddenly it hit me that oh, okay, it's the big stock principle. I used to like to mess around with a lot of teenage stocks, 12, 13, 14, 15 dollar stocks, and even six, seven, eight dollar stocks. You know, I like to think I was smarter than the market. I learned from you, know, you don't have to be smarter from the market. You just find out which stocks are the biggest stocks in the market that the institutions are buying up in droves and and that's where you go. And that was the big stock principle. So it wasn't something that took effect. So there's no, it's not really relevant to ask the question, uh, is this the juncture where that takes effect? It, to me that's always in effect in any bull market. So. Uh, but I think a good question helps me clarify that a little bit. I like this one, Dr. K. You can chime on in on this one. This is a great question. Regarding preparation for possible financial crisis, do you make contingency plans for worst-case scenarios? For example, if the fiscal cliff or some other near-term event leads to a financial crisis, how would you protect assets and plan to potentially profit? Would you stay with equities and cash or look to other asset categories, e.g. bonds, FX, CDs, FX meaning foreign currencies? Uh, CDs, derivatives, et cetera. Actually, Dr. K and I plan to uh, rock it off to, uh, what galaxy number is that, 125, Dr. K? 124. <laughs> 124, yeah, which is actually not, not too far from 129. I'm from 129, he's from 124. So we plan on just getting into our little pods, our space pods, and, and, and jetting uh, at the speed of light uh, to our gal respective galaxies in the, the event of a financial meltdown. So... That's the uh, the humorous answer, but you know I don't know. There, people ask about that. Who knows for sure? My approach has been to have physical gold, but that was bought a long time ago when you could see that the Fed, with easy interest rates uh, after 9/11 uh, and even before that, going into year 2000, which caused them to lower rates uh, quite a bit because they feared a, a potential crisis at that point, which never occurred. And all of the money printing and all the leveraging and debt and everything. So I, I bought, you know, I had a ton of money after '99 and making just a pile of money in the market because I, I was up nearly a thousand percent my own account that year. Actually, I was up over a thousand percent, but whatever. That, that's old history by now. But the point is, I made a lot of money back then, I, and there was just a lot of cash there. And I said I would just buy some gold. It looked to me like it was at a historical low. It turned out to be lucky, and it's probably my best trade of the last decade. But I think you need to have something uh, as an alternative currency in case you, people don't want dollars. And that could or could not happen. It's kind of a doomsday thing. So if you have physical gold, it's something you don't want to have to use. But I think you have to look at that or silver 
as potentially a medium of exchange, what happens if people don't want dollars and they're not going to take your dollars in exchange for goods and services? What do you use in the short term to deal with that? So, uh, you know, other people will say farmland, uh, real estate, you know, I'm covered in those areas. But if, by the same token, if you have farmland and you have a crisis, yeah, you can grow stuff on it, but where are you going to get the seeds, the fertilizers, the equipment to do all that? You're going to need to be able to buy them, and I don't think, uh, I, mean, I guess you could barter for a potential crop, but who knows if anybody would be willing to take the risk. I think you should own your home, so you know, having uh, your home uh, as your abode and you own it, the banks don't own it, uh, I think you're okay there. But you know, I also think you should be in a position to protect yourself. Uh, and I mean physically too, so that means guns and ammo, I would have lots of liquor around and uh, cigars, things that can also be used in barter. <laughs> so since you asked, th that's my opinion, but on the other hand, you know, it could turn out to be nothing. So remember one thing, we've had uh, a huge devaluations. the Weimar crisis in Germany did not cause all life to become extinguished in Germany. Uh, in previous uh, periods uh, as recently as the 1980s, 1990s, you had Russia and Brazil uh, doing the same thing, but life did not just become extinguished when that happens. So, you know, life will go on one way or another. Will there be chaos? I don't know. It's just, you like guns, buy, buy guns, you know, I guess. That's always one way to do it. Dr. K, what's your take? How are you protected against financial crisis? Well, you know, if you go back over history, over hundreds of years of history, there's always been, you know, it's, you don't have to look far to find plenty of doomsday scenarios that never play out. And, uh, you know, it's in, in this current environment, it's very easy to, conco easy to concoct loads of doomsday scenarios. And again, I don't see enough evidence that, that any of that is going to uh, come to fruition. What we'll see is what we've always seen in the past, that human life is very resilient. Humans are very dynamic creatures and therefore we will see um, a shifting perhaps um, of power structures and fiat currencies and you know that sort of shift is uh, quite a stir, causes quite a stir among societies but I ultimately believe that it will be for the greater good and you know the human race will continue onwards and upwards and if you look at uh, the parabolic rise of progress over say, you know, if you look back over the fa last 500 years, you can see that the last 50 years has been a lot steeper in increase than the last, say, you know, 2,000 years put together. And I believe that the next 50 years will be even faster than the, than the than the last 50 years. So uh, this doomsday stuff doesn't really uh, ring a, re resonate with me at all, simply because history doesn't bear it out. And we've we've had a lot of uh, situations where uh, where things could have gone from bad to worse very quickly and then did and then we were still able to recover very nicely so that that's my take on it <clears throat> let's see a couple of questions came out of that uh, someone says they if we have a meltdown I prefer the bees beans bullets and Budweiser I could pretty much go with that um, so where do you store your gold I think you need to have it outside the financial system I recommend private vaults and I don't, I don't have any recommendations because, uh, to me, that's all top secret information. But I would keep it outside of banks, basically outside the financial system. There was a guy on in Barron's over the weekend who wrote about gold, and, and I think he makes sense in the fact that uh, you know you have to think about that. I, I think having some percentage of your assets in gold is good, but you got to have it uh, in a private vault, one way or another. And there are private vaults out there, so it's, most of them are kind of not necessarily. Uh, well publicized. So, do you have a rule for going long a stock that is up many weeks in a row? An alternate entry technique? No. If it's going up many weeks in a row and it issues a pocket pivot, that could, uh, you know, that could uh, be a, just be a buy signal. Do you don't have a method like that, do you, Dr. Ken? I don't think that's no. what we look at. No. I mean, no, it's that, a, I mean, in a good market, and you get another pocket pivot up there. That's just a continuation pocket pivot and a, yeah, and a chance yeah, to add your position. Show you guys something. Um, let's look at. Oops, going the wrong way here. See, the market doesn't want to go down. That's the thing. That, you know, look at this, and the Nasdaq's now up and it's cruising up. The Dow's up 92. It just doesn't want to go down. It seems like you're probably sold out. So, we'll see what happens here. Anyways, let's uh, let me show you a weekly chart of Oracle, and we can go back actually to 1998, 99, because I remember I played Oracle. I made a lot of money in 1999. 
but before that, you know, here's here's a weekly chart. Actually, this is where I bought it and Zoom it did that, so I made a bunch of money on that. But notice here you have a bunch of weeks where it's up many weeks in a row. And back then, I remember that Bill and a number of us uh, at O'Neill thought that that was a very positive development. But of course, that wasn't really because you know it's kept going up. It's set up. It looked like it was going to you know form this flag and then launch out here, but then it just busted and, and had to form up again and set up in a deep cup with handle which then turned into a, a base here on top of this base so uh, you know that just goes to show you that it, it's not relevant and we would just focus on using pocket pivots Bible gap ups and just your standard base breakouts as buy points rather than um, you know this sort of it's basing it on this this straight up and up for many weeks um, somebody uh, says maybe all this discussion on financial ruin, ruin means the bottom is in and I, I would tend to agree with you on that. Uh, you know, right now everything is doom and gloom, and the whole world is coming to an end. Everybody knows that, and so uh, my question might be whether, uh, if that's the case, uh, maybe we are at a low right now. You know, so like we said, like we we're talking about here, uh, we could uh, we could slop and chop around, or you could even get a fall today and continue to rally. That's a possibility too. I don't really discount that potential. Uh, if you look at, let's see, any more questions out there, you guys? Get them in now. Let's see. I think we went through pretty much everything, but I'm going to go through some of the uh, stocks uh, in a second here. But let's see. What am I looking at here? There's a weekly, there's a daily, this is what I want. You know, this could just hold sideways in here. It doesn't necessarily have to zip right back to the downside. If it does, it tells you we're pretty weak. But you could just chop around for a while. You could even drift back up. The 50-day moving average comes down, and you could roll over. So, All right, now I want to get to some questions, some more questions on individual stocks that some of you have sent in here. Let's run through these. Dr. K, feel free to chime in if you got anything to say, okay? Yeah, as usual, of course. Okay, everybody wants to know what's up with the buy signal on the UVXY. Uh, you want to go ahead and explain with that? Yeah, the U UVXY is um, that that is a short-term um, indicator, and it sensed uh, it's it's of of course it's on a day-to-day -day basis it may not be correct. It is looking for that short-term edge. Um, in this case, it's uh, the market has gone higher, um, and it is holding to its buy signal at the moment because of the re reversion to the mean issue. So in other words, if the market rolls over here, then the signal should, the UVXY buy signal should become profitable. But it's of course, right. it's a short term, so it's not going to sit on its buy signal in, uh, you know, very long. If, if the market wants to go higher here and it looks like it, we might just have a weak upward trend, then actually both models are probably going to go back to cash in that situation. We yeah. could have a situation like we saw, say, in June of 2011, where the market tested the uh, the 200 day and then it went it went higher on pretty weak volume, and that was actually the end of QE uh, QE2 that was the month of June. So if the market chops and slops here, you can see this come back to the top of the range at least. So we'll see what happens. It's a work in progress. Okay, let's go to some questions. Some more in that sense, uh, ask us about it. I'm not. Nothing there. We even bothered with it, right, Dr. K? Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much off the radar completely. You know, we're not we're not bottom fishers unless the market unless unless you have extreme. You know, if if you're coming out of a bear market situation, then then bottom ship fishing can sometimes work if there's nothing out there uh, that looks like it's going to be um, breaking to new highs on a good on a good basing pattern, but I'll take a good base uh, breakout or a good pocket pivot out of a out of a good base any day over a bottom fishing technique. Right. So there's nothing there. Nothing there. Texas bank shares, uh, Texas capital bank shares. I've seen this one. It's chopping sideways and in a little flag. It's a thinner, smaller bank. I noticed some of the smaller banks are doing better, but uh, I'm not a big fan of banks. Generally, don't turn into huge winners, but this one has actually done okay so far. Uh, actually, you know what? I want to take a look at the weekly chart. Yeah, it's in a base. But and it's had a you know decent move so far breaking out of this cup with handle, I guess you go, but it's a pretty ugly looking pattern. So I don't know, it doesn't really thrill me. Not that dynamic. I mean ask yourself this, is it a big stock? Um, 
gold and silver, we sold uh, our gold today because it broke 155, which is the low of this gap up day. So that's basically our position. Uh, our thinking is it's going to, if it broke down, it's going to need more time to set up and there will be another buy signal later on. But we bought some in here uh, on the basis of the uh, of this gap up and uh, it, it tried to move higher and it looked good yesterday and it reversed, found resistance here. They got an area of congestion. So our thinking is here you'll you'll see a buy signal for this. We haven't issued of, of any pocket pivot buy signals on this at all. Although down here we did talk about the fact that it might have been viable using the lows of the pattern here. Since you are in this big basing area, you could use the lows of the pattern as your quick stop. So it could still see uh, see those lows. That's a possibility too. So right now we're not long this and uh, or silver, uh, although we did like them a few days ago. They looked okay, but they're not really following through, which tends to argue for more sideways action on the precious metals. Correct, Dr. King? Yeah, uh, you know, after Bernanke's testimony, um, gold got hit pretty hard. Uh, in other words, the market's saying uh, we don't like that uh, Bernanke has basically not telegraphed any, any sort of QE3, um, except to say that the markets are going to Basically, things are going to have to go from bad to worse before he steps in with his QE3, and that is also what the uh, ECB has telegraphed to the markets, and therefore that gold has sold off here, I think, also adds weight to a, a potential continuation of this downtrend we're seeing in the general markets. But we're, not, we're actually not seeing a, the downtrend. I'm seeing intraday the market moving higher. So what if the market moves sharply higher? Let's throw that one out there. Why are stocks up while gold is getting hit hard? What's uh, what is the disconnect here, and why? Right. Well, it's not really a disconnect because um, on a day, on an interday basis, you can get disconnects all the time, um, and those disconnects can be caused by who knows HFTs. It could be caused uh -huh. by Q. There is QE in the system, so QE could be could be the culprit here, pushing markets higher, sculpting them so that you know to look like things aren't so bad. Um, but on a, I would say on a, a longer term basis, maybe on the order of you know days instead of intraday, uh, we should see a reconnect. So in other words, if we start, if gold starts to go lower and retest those lows, I would expect that, that that's telegraphing that, you know, where's QE? And um, the markets want QE. If they don't sense that they're getting it, I would expect the markets to also um, head lower. Yeah, I think the crowd wants QE. I wonder if the market's going to fake out the crowd and go higher without QE on a potential the basis of a potential inflection point in U.S. economic policy with uh, Obama out and Romney in uh, and a shift there because I think the Wisconsin election I think is somewhat important and also the what's going on in San Jose and uh, San Diego in my home state here of uh, or our home state actually of California Chris and I were both born here and uh, you know whether uh, that, that means there's a turning point here in all this madness. So n even though the situation doesn't necessarily get solved entirely, you might create something of an inflection point. You know, that's the other side of the argument. We've been debating all of this uh, all morning long. And, of course, you can see even the market, there's nothing really conclusive uh, in the market, although we are trading heavier volume today and we're holding up so far. So it's kind of interesting. So we'll just see what happens. But uh, kind of interesting to watch, and I think... You don't have to remain heavily committed here. If you want to go with the market direction model signal, uh, you can take a partial position. I think that's what we're doing here. Yeah, um, and, and also the markets are forward-looking. So, um, and I think you know, if, if once they sense that Obama's out, uh, I think that could spark a rally. Um, so, you know, these elections are are pivotal, and uh, you know, markets do look forward typically by six months or longer, or you know, three to six months or longer. So. Um, you know, it's one, it's definitely uh, an election results to watch. Yeah, so it's yeah. A, a fluid situation here. So we'll start through some other names here. I, I got to tell you, a lot of people are bringing up names. I don't know if these are shorts, but none of these are hitting my my uh, radar screen. I'm Shaw Industries uh, continues to move higher. It's been in a straight uptrend. So is that telling you that housing is bottom? Maybe so. But you know, unless you see, uh, I mean, let's go back there. I mean, you could say you've got a pocket. Continuation pocket pivot here, so that's the only thing I see in terms of a buy point. Hain Celestial has been acting okay; it's still holding up, but there's no buy points in there, so we're not buyers. Yum, uh, yum. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, if I wanted to go short, maybe uh, this might work. So it's been a reasonable leader, so. Possibly a little compact sort of head and shoulders. So watch that one. You're rallying up into. If you wanted to draw, 
uh, a neckline, say, it looks like from here to here. I don't know, somewhere in there. It's railing up back through it, so I don't know if that's a possibility. Not one I'm looking at, though. Monster, uh, whoops. Monster Beverage, he had a uh, pocket pivot. Right, where did you have one last, Dr. K? It was right here? Yeah, you had this one, and it's actually held that. So it's actually act acting okay. You notice it's making higher highs and uh, higher lows as the market was moving lower, and uh, now it's actually uh, all time closing highs up here. So it's dissecting very constructively. So uh, hard to say, you know, I'd like to see a pullback. If it pulled back, maybe I'd be interested if the market uh, develops more of an uptrend in that case. But it's definitely a stock that's continued to act well. And definitely remains one of the leaders of the market currently. So, uh, Joy, it's just like cat, it's a dog. So, but again, you know, way down there. So, are these things going to continue breaking? If if so, then we're in a weak market, very weak situation here. F5, I already talked about straight down. So, tries to rally back into the 200 day. You could have shorted it early today and you'd be making some money. Uh, but you know, it's not clear whether you're at a point where it's going to bust and head down through 95 or whether it's just going to diddle around for a while. So Devon Energy, I think this one is. So not really what I'm looking at. It's ugly as sin, but, you know, not. I, I think I know what you think you see here uh, is a head and shoulders. But if this is a head and shoulders, it's sort of a couple of years long. So I don't It doesn't really, really uh, seem like anything to me right now. Somebody asks about URI and URI. It's a dog, so I'm not. It's, it's a, you can see the late stage fail base, so theoretically could have been shorted here on this breakdown. It rallies right up into this area, which is some resistance, and now you're rallying back up in. And it looks like a 20-day, 10-day sort of zone here. So I don't know. Is this shortable? Is it heading through the 200-day and this low? Maybe it is. So you know, any of these things, if you want to short them, I would come after them with using the high of the day as your stop. So keep. A relatively tight stop and keep an eye on the general market, but you, there are a lot of patterns like this. So to me, it's pretty obvious that everything is in breakdown mode, and so uh, that's why I'm a little skeptical. I think, yeah, some of these could go lower, uh, but uh, it could take a little more time. So I'm kind of patient here on the short side, let things pan out as far as it goes with stocks. Uh, FBHS, I would not short here. It's not t totally breaking down, so it, it's also not a big leader. And I don't know. It's gone from 11 bucks to 20. Or so you know, is is this maybe this could be a uh, a right right side of the head on here on this breakdown? So you have a left shoulder head. Maybe it would need to form another right shoulder. But to me, this is kind of neither here nor there really. And it's a thinner, smaller stock. So not necessarily my favorite. But I'm not a big short fan. ULTA. There's a, a gap up and a breakout. Find some resistance here. Maybe it goes sideways. But I'm not a buyer of this one either. How about you, Dr. K? You like Ulta Salon Cosmetics and Fragrances? It's an, a viable gap up, um, well, by, by textbook uh, means, on a good earnings report. And again, if I had to buy a stock in this kind of market environment, um, you know, I like this one because, because of the pattern, because of the gap up, and because of the strong earnings. The numbers look pretty good overall, and the industry group um, is strong. You know, everything looks pretty damn good on the stock. So. Right. Uh, again, if I had to buy something, this would be one of those stocks. Okay, so you like it. Notice here you have, do have big supporting week off the lows. So uh, I think we like Mellanox, probably one of our favorites. You like this one. I think this one's okay. Um, I've got some Facebook here off of yesterday's lows, and I'm watching to see how it's developed. <laughs> so we'll see. But other than that, let's see what else looks hot. Li liquidity, this one actually has been acting okay. Uh, it's kind of reversing today, but we'll see what happens here. But that's another one to keep on your uh, your list. Let's see. Someone's asking about Cybex. I think this is. It's a breakout. So uh, well, the LQDT. I'd, I'd be careful though because it three times now it tends to have these really yeah, nasty takeouts. It has these weird spinouts. You're right, and it's done that several times. You know, zip here. Here's a big spin out. Spin out. Big spin out over here. Yeah, that, that's one thing I don't like about. It. You're right. Good point. Good point. Cybex, you like this one, Dr. K, Cyberonics? This one, well, it's, again, in this market environment, I just hate, I hate these thin things. Um, you know, if we get into a, a period where the window is clearly open, like it was in, say, late uh, 2006, then I start to love these names because these are the names that tend to go up the most in the shortest amount of time. But we haven't really had a proper open window environment in a long time, and, and, and the market clearly favors stocks that are much more uh, institutional quality 
And so this one, you know, can look. It looks good on the chart and everything. The fundamentals look good, but um, I'm just uh, I'm I don't like having to risk money in these kinds of stocks in this kind of environment. Got it. Somebody says so. Facebook is uh, bottom fishing. You know, I, here's something interesting: is that uh, having worked with O'Neill, he has techniques for buying off the lows, and we have bottom fishing pocket pivots that work sometimes. So, if you look at Facebook and you look at the eBay situation, there's a few other sort of IPO turns, but eBay is the most like it because it got cratered 50 percent, selling at 200 times earnings when it came public. So it was wildly overvalued, like Facebook. And we did have methods for buying things off the of lows, things like three waves down and other exciting things. The institutional salesman at, at O'Neill used to love it when you went through a bear market and the first time you saw a big leader from the prior cycle, which maybe had just been a leader for one cycle, finally burst above the 200-day or 40-week moving average on huge volume. That would be a, a, a buy signal, and the institutional sales guys would all get, get on the phone and call their institutional clients with that, and they loved it. So there are methods for buying off the of lows. So you know, uh, I don't know. Some, if someone was trying to make a joke, it, you obviously just don't really know what the real story is in terms of the fact that there are some methods for buying off the lows, and we will employ them. They're riskier, and you have to account for that when you're dealing with it. But there are ways uh, to do it. I like this question because it helps make a point. I think, and somebody says, "Would Mellanox be classified as a high volume reversal if it continues to?" Uh, if it continues to trade lower today, uh, well, you'd have to have a big volume spike here, so I don't think you'd call it a high volume reversal necessarily. And you're trading only one percent above average, and since yesterday's volume was uh, about uh, what was that, Dr. K? Like uh, twice. It's not going it, to. It, there's no way it's it's going to. No, there's no way it's going to be a high volume. volume. But again, you know, don't don't worry about having to classify things. So you know, it, even if you had a heavy volume and it held tight in here, it still might be okay. Uh, it just may be a function of the market because people get nervous when they see something break to new highs, and you might have some overhead from here that comes into play as this thing tries to move higher. So for all you know, it's going to work its way up slowly, and then build a handle and form a cup and handle or something and go higher. Who knows? But I wouldn't get bogged down with trying to uh, to label it. Cerner Cerner is. Uh, been in IVD a lot, and it's okay. It's actually okay. It's holding the 50-day moving average, so you know, look for some kind of pocket pivot eventually here. But it looks like it might need to settle down a little bit first. Uh, Qcore is in that one that we did mention. It had a pocket pivot yesterday, but notice how it takes you right up into the top of the base, so it may need some time to work sideways. But that looks okay. I mean, maybe if you had a pullback down into 42, you could pick up some shares on the basis of the pocket pivot. But uh, there was some good news for them yesterday. I think that's really what. Uh, Happen. So, somebody says uh, economy question. My son is doing this one's for you, Dr. K. My son is doing market analysis in Chengdu, China. Sichuan Cooking, Panda Bear Central. They are having trouble with the projections because there are so few young people coming along with a shrinking population and no rule of law. What is the case for China being the economy of the future? That's an interesting uh, one That's for you, question. Dr. K. Let me, let me let you pontificate on that. I'll be back in just uh, in 30 seconds here. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, that's that is a big question in terms of where is China? How is China going to lead uh, the world in terms of? Um, well, it's 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 no it's no surprise that they are projected to be the world's leading economy um, within the next ten years or sooner, probably sooner than that. Um, and uh, you know, the U.S. will fall back. Um, the thing with China, they, they have a way of doing things that are so different from what we understand in the West and my friend who is a professor, he's originally from Texas, he's US born citizen and he's been a professor at Dalian University and for a number of years now so he's been quite indoctrinated into the culture, he quite loves it, he's quite taken with it but he also sees serious issues in terms of rule of law, in terms of how the governments operate, in terms of the power structure um, and he is Basically torn between um, loving loving the culture and hating it, and as far as the uh, economy of China, and uh, they're, they're very very intelligent at the top, and and they have huge they have trillions of dollars in credit. Um, they're just the opposite of the U.S. or the U.K. or Europe. So and no, they know that they they're very they use that 
credit that all that capital they have at their disposal much as any country would in that they expect to get their way, they expect to be a, a bully uh, in, in, in some matter of speaking, and much as the U.S. has been the world's bully for, for many, many decades. Um, or any, any of these countries, really. Uh, I don't want to put a negative light on any particular country, but when a country has a lot of capital at their disposal, they're going to use that. They're going to muscle their way uh, to get their way. And China's going to be no different. Um, fortunately, from what I understand, you know, they are making intelligent moves, and they understand that the world is connected, so they can't just throw a country overboard because they know that's going to hit, that's going to hurt them. I mean, they, they, I believe they see the war, they see themselves and they see the world as, say, you know, if you're a, a single person, you don't want to cut off your thumb, and and so they want to keep everything intact as best they can uh, while maintaining their leadership. And uh, ultimately, I think that is a good thing. That is a good measure of policy, but there are obviously a lot of snafus in the way they run things, and there's a lot of casualties that 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 uh, occur as a result of that. So it'll be interesting to see how China plays out in in the months and years ahead. Um, and you know, we will see indication. You know, you can look at the FXI. That's the Chinese ETF. Um, a good reference point to see how the Chinese economy is doing. They lowered rates today. You know, they want to keep things going. They want to keep. You know, they're not stupid. Let's just say that they're they're very educated at the top. So I don't think we have to be in panic mode in terms of you know China's moves. But they also know that they're an emerging country. So uh, emerging countries tend to have huge runs, run ups, and huge setbacks as well as they move as they move forward. So are you basically saying to kind of distill it down? Are you saying then that capitals uh, China's capital reserves and currency reserves? Uh, outweigh the potential demographic problem because a lot of the U.S. growth has been predicated a, a, upon the rise of the baby boomer. Even the growth in the investment industry and the whole all the trends there uh, have been responsible for a lot of the growth in the U.S. And there is an issue as as the baby boomers age. So with China not having any uh, much youth coming up to fill the ranks, how how specifically do you create a mechanism where having a surplus of capital or currency reserves compensates for that? Now, that's a good question, and essentially, what's going to happen? This and this is uh, this has been projected. Actually, this is not an original thought on my part. But what what uh, has been projected is that because China's had this one-child policy, um, and India is just the opposite, India will overtake China as the world's leading economy potentially in say the uh, you know by twenty twenty-five, somewhere in that area. Because India will be will have incredibly strong demographics and China won't, and that will be a tipping point for those two countries who will probably be neck and neck at that point, and uh, India will overtake. Okay. Anyways, I think you can just watch the chart right now. I don't think you want to be buying into China just yet. It's in a bear market or a correction at least looks like. Yeah. Uh, I guess you could say it's a bear market, huh? Yeah. Here's a weekly chart, and it's been in a, a downtrend off the peak here for quite a while. So. Uh, so it's still doggy. So I mean, it's telling you that China's got some issues to work through. But like Dr. K said, you know, emerging economies, and just like the U.S., have great long-term prospects. But they are going to have their bull and bear periods, and and those are normal parts of the uh, of the overall macro uh, uh, trends in terms of economic growth. Anyways, some more names here. Equix, another name. That's a nice choppy name. All over the place. You had uh, Pocket Pivot anywhere, Dr. K? No, I don't really see it. Maybe you could call this a pocket pivot. That's actually up on the day, even though it kept up. Yeah, you up. could call that a few days ago. That would be a pocket pivot. Yeah, so yeah, it's acting okay. It acts better uh, than most stocks out there. But you're way up there, so you're trying to form a flag. It's a little bit loose on the weekly chart. I can make it look tighter here, actually, if I want to. But you notice on a closing basis, it's eh, kind of kind of sloppy. It's a little bit of a sloppy name there, but it acts okay. EW is uh, what is this? Is this uh, Ew, Edwards Life Sciences. Yeah, it's just a big ugly cup and handle. So, looks on the daily chart, maybe yeah, a little extended for a pocket pivot there. Not really any buy signals in here. Probably a lower tier uh, stock, not a big stock. Trends. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not liking this one enough. I mean, it had a gap down, two two gap downs in that base, and then a gap up. Uh, it's very sloppy. And again, you want to be putting your money into the best merchandise in this in this market environment. Yeah. Uh, somebody asks, is DDD, you like this one, uh, trans time, real quick? Oh, yeah, TDG, um, well, that, yeah, that, it, it's, again, it, it's acting, it, it's acting pretty well, the fundamentals are good, um, 
you know, you could take a little, take a small position in the stock. Uh, it doesn't look like it's doing anything wrong per se, and it gets support at the 50. Yeah, and you'll, you'll notice here you got big volume and you got some support off the 50-day moving average. That looks pretty good. That's okay. Still, it's still a name to have on your buy watch list. Uh, 3D Systems. Is it too wild of a pattern? I don't know. This thing reminds me of uh, Tango or this. Uh, what's that? UBNT. That was a uh, ubiquity. You know, this one was real choppy too on the way up, and then it blew apart. So I don't know. I, I would say this one kind of reminds me of it uh, to some extent. Uh, triple D, and here's what Tango looked like, you know, chopping around, very choppy. That other one was, uh, uh, which one uh, was I just talking about? Uh, UVMT, yeah, that's right, Ubiquity, that was choppy on the way up. You remember that was very volatile and, and then it blew apart. So now you have this one, you know, it's, it's pretty choppy, but you know, if you can buy it right and sit, I guess maybe you're okay. Uh, how do you, you like this one, Dr. K? Yeah, it's not it's not really on my radar. It's it's just not. Uh, I don't like the. There's too many holes in the, in in the stock. So yeah, yeah, it's not it's not in the, not right. a stock for this environment. Last question, Doctor K. Uh, what is a good India ETF to watch? I would say um, I think let's see IF I think IFN is uh, that's India fund. Um, hold on a second. Let me just go through. Oh, there's EPI as well, but they're they kind of mirror each other. Yeah, I would go. I would go with uh, either of those. So what are those again? EPI and IFN. EPI, pretty. Yeah, that one trades pretty thick. Yeah, that's a nice one. IFN. That one's thinner. I think I like the thick one. So, anyways, so that's pretty much all we got, you guys. Oh, wait, wait, one more, a couple more questions. Another one coming in. INDL. I don't know. It hasn't hit my. Uh, what's INDL? Oh yeah, oh, that's, that's, a, that's another one. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a really thin one. I like the first one you talked about that that you mentioned. That's more liquid. I, I when in doubt, go with the more liquid ETF. Well, I, I, INDL is the three X. That's a three X uh, bull. Um, okay. And and uh, you know that's that's certainly one uh, that that mirrors. Um, although. I would I would go with I, um, the EPI or the uh, IFN because those are es essentially one X. They're, they're funds, and so they're I think they're a better indication of where the India market is really at. Whereas INDL is a three X, meaning it, it, it's subject to great distortions um, in both directions. As, as we've discussed, leveraged ETFs are going to benefit from trends, and they're going to um, not benefit from from slop, call them slop chop zones. Okay. All right. So on the the MDM sell signal, your favorite ETF is e EDZ to play. Uh, and let's see. In terms keep of in mind loss, that, uh, that on, on wrong signals, ED, EDZ is going to suffer the most as well. So position wow, size man. accordingly. It's it's a three times ETF. So yeah. So the there. bottom line is really with the indexes, you're at a logical point here where you could find resistance and just chop down to there. So we'll see how that pans out, or if if you just end up holding tight and trying to go higher. I, to me, I think you, there's a number of outcomes. Like we were talking about last week, you're in this sort of fat-tailed environment where you're, you're dealing in the uh, fat-tailed distribution curve where you can have uh, just a wider range of outcomes and probabilities based on the craziness of the situation. So I think we remain fluid right here. You're on a sell signal. I think that's about it. Uh, interestingly, on short notice, we had, a, I think, one of the biggest crowds we've had on one of these webinars so far. So it does look like you guys are... Uh, in the heat of battle, if you're able to uh, show up for this on short notice. Anyways, thanks for showing up, everybody. That's all we've got. Anything else, Dr. K? No, I think we're good. All right. Take care, everyone. Catch you later. So long, everyone.